evening to everyone. It is good to be in this place, and we want to thank you for taking the time and coming out this Sunday evening as we will uh, engage at the annual uh, Raymond Ford Memorial Lecture. We want to invite those here in the sanctuary with us to stand. We want to welcome those that are joining us on the World Wide Web and the various platforms that are connected here to the Shekinah Church of God, well, the Shekinah Church. We want to thank God for all that He has done. We want to welcome you this evening. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you for your goodness and your mercy that you have extended toward us. We want to thank you for your people gathered here and for those that have joined us on the social media platform. We pray, Almighty God, that you will be here with us this evening. You will bring a large cheer and that you will preside over this time of learning and ministry. We pray, O oh God, your special blessing upon our speaker this evening, Dr. Eden. And we ask, O oh God, that you would help us not only to be hearers as we retain the information, but Lord, that we will be stimulated to go and do what we are challenged to do. In the name of Jesus Christ, O oh Lord. Welcome to Shekinah, and at this time, we are going to have Ben Mothers of Salem, Sister Alicia Brathwaite. She is uh, going to uh, lead us in this song, especially, uh, this song was especially selected or requested by Dr. Eden, Sister Lisa. Thank you. 
who sometimes fill my cup until it runs over. Well, that was Dr. Evelyn's communication uh, to us regarding her bio. But I want you to know also that she's very well qualified to speak with us this evening or speak to us this evening. Dr. Evelyn is a sociologist and she is the chairman of Protect Children's Foundation. This is an empowerment uh, foundation for orphans and disadvantaged children. Dr. Evelyn is ministering in Uganda. All right. So we want to thank God for this lady at this point in time. I want to tell you a little bit about the you, you may say, thank you. I want to tell you a little bit about the Raymond Ford uh, lecture uh, that will be presented this evening. Some of you don't know. And we want to share that Deacon Raymond Ford was formerly a member of the Emmanuel Missions Church. He was a lay worker at the Emmanuel Missions Church in Church Village, St. Philip. He was instrumental in helping to found and establish. It was he who pioneered the college meetings and instrument the college meeting and revival services in that community, resulting in what is known now as Shekinah Lesbian Holiness Church. Credit is also given to him in assisting the founding of the Emmanuel Missions Church at Ragged Point Church from its beginnings until about 1920. Raymond Ford never officially entered pastoral ministry, but served both Church Village and Ragged Point under the guidance and supervision of J. W. Humphrey, superintendent of the Emmanuel Missions Churches. Raymond Ford also had a big hand in founding the development of the Messiah's House Church, now Messiah's House. And in 1921, Raymond Ford was ill, and he spent some time in Martin, Martin's Day recuperating. There he received a healing touch from the Lord and determined to continue to serve the Lord in his community. He was living in, in the Messiah Street area, and invited the Christian World Church from St. Philip and, and St. John. He began opening meetings in Messiah Street, and many persons sought the Lord as a result of the church that was started. The expanse, the expanse of starting the church was worn mainly by uh, Brother Ford. Later, when a hall was housed, the church was put up for sale, the object of getting rid of the old mission people. Brother Ford borrowed money on his crops and loaned the church to buy the hall on Messiah Street, now known as Messiah's house as it was established. Brother Ford's sacrificial giving and work of the Lord is legendary. His daughter, Vasi, who has lived to be over a hundred years old, reported personally how he sold his meal as a part of his carting business and gave the money from the sale to help complete the building um, which was now constructed to help the congregation at the queue, now the Mount of Praise Church. Such sacrifices is unheard in these modern unheard of in these modern times. Here is a layman who had the spirit and soul of the master. The Barbados district will not forget him and countless near men and women who have helped Build the Western Holden Holiness Church. Raymond Ford was a product of Church Village, but a layman to the total Barbados district. And it is indeed a great honor, it is indeed a great privilege to have with us this evening Dr. Evelyn. It is Uganda, Dr. Evelyn, Uganda. It's Uganda. Yes. It's in Uganda. Where you are, you'll be a student. At the moment, you're in Kiev. Yes, please. I just wanted to get that. 
So we are indeed privileged to have uh, Dr. Ewan here to address uh, this evening's topic. And we want to make way for her as she will uh, come to speak with us uh, regarding the care of children. Dr. Ewan, let's stand and receive her this evening. Thank you. Something 
today in his honor. I want to thank Sister Alicia Rathwit for that Mothers of Salem. Now that comes straight from scripture. There are parallel passages in Matthew 19, 13 to 14, and Mark 10, 13 to 16. It really shows how God loves the children. Can we have the PowerPoint, please? How God, how Jesus, yeah, from the beginning, Don't be distracted. The power is not in the PowerPoint. That is just, you know, to keep your, your attention going. But if it's going to be a distraction, blanket. Yes. Can you put it in presentation mode, please, and start from the beginning? And then I'll just give you a thumbs up every time I want you to change. Yeah, those two passages in Matthew and Mark show conclusively that Jesus loved, Jesus loved children. No, God, he didn't just love them. He wanted them with him, he says. And, and guess what? You realize what happened in that, in that passage? The people who should know better, the disciples, the pastors at at we would call it. And they're the ones, instead of drawing the children to Jesus, they are the ones that are saying, come, you're, you're bothering the master. You ever hear anything like that? And Jesus had to rebuke them. He said, no, don't send them away. And the passage in, Matthew, in Mark goes a little further. Jesus says, if you don't become like one of these innocent children, you ain't entering the kingdom of heaven. Um, there seems to be some problem with the PowerPoint, and that's fine. We're going to leave it there. Now, language is absolutely fascinating. I love language. I, I did linguistics at university. And here you have a sentence. The role of today's child in tomorrow's church. But what does that mean? The role of today's child in tomorrow's church. When we talk about role, what are we talking about? The likely role. So if you look at today's child and you say, hey, if this continues, what's going to happen? Are we looking at the likely role? Next slide. Or are we looking at the ideal role? What is the ideal role of today's child in tomorrow's church? And if you're asking that, you have to ask, well, what is the ideal role of children in today's church? But then we come to children. And the question is, are we talking about children, the church, children, you know, those that were conceived in the church and grew up in the church and come to church morning, noon, and night. Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, and so on. Are we talking about these churched children or are we talking about unchurched children? And if we're talking about unchurched children or church children. Are we talking about those who are born again? Because everybody that comes to church is born again, right? Everybody with me so far? Yeah. Fine. So, who really are we talking about? We know that by the laws of Barbados, children six are anybody under 16 and some laws will put it to 18. So, for our purposes, we know that as far as chronological age goes, we're talking about people who are less than 18. Children. Are they church? Are they unchurched? Are they born again? And then now, 
this is the troublesome one. Are we talking when we say church? You know, that is a word. There are some words I am afraid to use. God, church, Christian. Because once upon a time, remember I said I got saved in 77. And in those days, I knew what God meant. I also knew what church meant. And I knew who a Christian was. But right now, man, I dodge those words. I, I say, Bible-believing. I don't say Christian, I say Bible-believing Christians. And I don't just say God. God, the Father of Jesus Christ. Because there are all kinds of gods these days, you know? So, we are looking at the role of children, and we're asking, what's the role of these children in church, in tomorrow's church. And when we talk about church, are we talking about church, the organization, or church, the organism, which is the li living, breathing body of Christ? Because church, now I said that, I ain't saying that word too easy, church is like a religious social club. You know, you have the Kiwanis and you have the Toastmasters. Well, you have the Evangelical Church and you have the established churches. And that is church as an organization. So you have the leader of a church, an established church, who says, hey, Genesis 1 to 11, those are a myth. He's a part of the church too. So let's, let's try to figure out who we're talking about this afternoon in the next few minutes. And then we'll have a question and answer that might be a bit longer. Okay? We're talking about children, church, unchurched, and those who are born again. Because when you, when you think of somebody who isn't born again, try to say they're not born again yet. They haven't given their life to Christ yet. I have lived long enough. I ain't no spring chicken. And I have lived long enough to see some of the most unlikely people get saved. I've also lived long enough to see some of the most unlikely people leave the church. Some of the people who were born in church and grew up in church and served in church and they left. So when we're talking about children, we're talking about everybody, all children. And we're going to talk for a moment, we want to look at the likely role of children in tomorrow's church, but then we want to spend most of the time looking at the ideal Role and exactly how we can make sure that our children of today become an asset to the church of tomorrow. All things being equal, what is likely? Now, I'm going to talk about the world of children as I see it from where I sit. You will hear that I'm a sociologist. Prior to that, I was a guidance counselor. Prior to that, I was a social worker, Lord have mercy. And prior to that, I was a teacher. I never wanted to be a teacher, but I got a scholarship. I had to go back home, and they wanted me to teach, and so I went back home and I taught. So I know a little bit about children. And from where I sit, and I look at today's child, Consider what that child is up against. Social media, the WhatsApp, the Facebook, the Instagram, the TikTok, the all kinds of everything, the movies. You know, we talk about TV. I don't, people don't watch TV anymore. You know, think of YouTube and all the stuff that's on YouTube. Just consider what our children are up against. It just comes at you 
and comes at you and comes at you and it isn't always good stuff. As a matter of fact, most times it is not good stuff. So here are our children, the peony ones, because you see little two-year-olds and three-year-olds and they have their tablet. And they, they know how to operate it better than their parents. So they're up against social media. Then there's the whole question, can we have the next slide please? Psychoactive substances. Now, years ago, youth used to have a run-of-the-mill kind of stuff that would tempt them. You know, the world of youth, what's there to trouble youth? You don't want to get into drugs, you don't want to get into gambling, you don't want to get into sex. That's, that's what it was, basically. But now it's much more. Because if you say you don't want to get into drugs, it's not just marijuana and this and that and the other. It's all kinds of everything. All kinds of psychoactive substances. Things that you wouldn't think about and they are exposed to. And when we talk about sex and sexuality, it's not just the boy-girl thing and you say, oh boy, keep away from the opposite sex. Right now, you got to say, keep away from the opposite sex and from your sex as well. Because there are young people who believe that anything goes. And sadly, subtly, they are taught this in school, on social media, on the road, where you have all kinds of science and so on. You know, the environment itself teaches our children once upon a time. You notice it keeps going back to once upon a time. Things have changed. It's not what it was. Once upon a time, the agents of socialization would have been home, the church, and the school. Now, what home are you talking about? What goes on at home? What is home? Home is just a place with different apartments where people come and sleep. Everybody eat in their own bedroom. You're not sitting down at a table and having a nice meal, you know? <laughs> I, I smile because I'm thinking of these two brothers and they are whatsapping each other from one room to the next. So what, what is home? You have however many friends on Facebook, but how many actual friends do you have? And some of our children grow up very miserably in homes even in Christian homes. And one pet peeve is that some of our children are of no fixed place of abode. Because the way that we do family in the Caribbean, not just Barbados, but in the Caribbean, is that you have a child with a woman, you have child mothers and you have child fathers, we don't have parents. Now I speak generally, of course you have some really good homes and so on, but I'm speaking from what I see, okay? And now I'm going to social work and what you see. Children being raised and by law, they spend weekend with the mommy and week with the daddy or Monday to Wednesday, one home and Thursday, all kinds of crap. And they spend Christmas here and the day after Christmas here and it is very difficult. Once I was doing some work and I won't go into the details but it involved a number of young people and they were doing okay, a, a survey and as I stood there and it's a lot of them, you know, and I saw this young man on his chin and on his thing and you know the at risk look and I am there and I'm watching and I'm watching and I'm making up my mind I am going to talk to this guy 
I want to talk to this guy because he looks like he needs somebody to talk with him. So when we finished and I tried to figure out how do I get around to talk with him, I started. And as we spoke, I asked him, where do you live? Who do you live with? And that guy, he was like a late teen, he hesitated. You imagine somebody asks you where you live and you hesitate? The guy didn't even know where he lived. Well, sometimes and sometimes. That's the world that our children live in. Which leaves them unsure, it leaves them puzzled, it leaves them lost, it leaves them baffled, and they are unclear. And why are they unclear? Because, remember we say, school used to be a place of socialization, and there was a certain homogeneity of values and so on. But now the children go to school, in first form they learn one thing because they have one set of teachers that believe one set of things and have a particular worldview. And then in second form, they have another set of teachers with another set of worldview. Or maybe even in first form, they have five teachers with one worldview and six with another and two with none. And the poor children are confused. Confused. Now, if we consider children like that, and all things being equal, what will the church of tomorrow look like? I want to read something. I asked Chantel best, but I didn't hear back from her. So Chantel, if you're listening, I am using your Facebook <laughs> post of March the 20th. I'm sure she won't mind. It says, attention all parents and guardians. If you are a parent or guardian who has a keen interest in what your children are doing, if you want to see them do well, please make a habit of checking their devices. My son was added to a WhatsApp community called Biggest Food Chat in BIM. You see it? Next slide, please. Biggest Room, you can't see, but it says Biggest Room Chat in BIM. He has no idea who submitted his number, but this community has about 100 groups and in one chat alone, there are about 900 children. Bear that in mind, those of you who are taking notes, bear that in mind, because we're going to look at some other groups that don't even have in nine children. These groups are covering, if not all, nearly every school in Barbados. I've been deleting groups from my son's phone since Saturday, and I only got it deleted this all this morning. There are so many groups, I can't name them all, but the conversations and the sexual content in these groups are astounding. I did not bring a clip of a young guy, maybe 14, because it would be sacrilegious to bring it in God's house. If you hear it, you run. The language is deplorable, so deplorable, that it has left me seriously wondering what will become of our young people in the future. Check up on your children. The devil is working overtime. Update. Check Telegram as well. I hear it's even worse there. Next slide. So who is teaching our children? I am told that most, yeah. let's do it. By a show of hands, how many of you got saved before you were 18? 18 and on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Those who got saved between 18 and 21. Three, four, five. Okay? Those who got saved after 21. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So, the American statistics are right, just like it's happening here. 
62%, according to a Barna study done in 2002, 62% of persons get saved before they are 18. There is also a study that says 94% get saved before the 18, but I take that with a pinch of salt. The fact is, most people get saved before the 18. So when we talk about the role of today's child, we've got to get those children and share the word of God with them before the 18, because after that, you have 18 to 21, where a few more get saved, and after 21, they're set in stone. A lot of people are set in stone. So we, we have to be really, really serious and intentional when we talk about our children and we look at who's teaching them. Now, there's a, a group called Dance for Life. It says, this is from their web page, it says, it's a movement dedicated to the youth of Barbados. I don't doubt that there is some good in what Dance for Life does. Maybe there's a whole lot of good, but a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Let's, next slide please, and I will read what Dance for Life says. Dance for Life goes into schools, it's like an extracurricular activity. It says, why dance? Dance is a celebration of life. Through movement, we feel empowered in our bodies. We find individual expression, we connect and commune with others, we have fun. Dancing is the signature of the choices we make. So far, so good. Dance for Life believes that young people must be equipped with the knowledge and resources they need to make the right choices for themselves and to move through the challenges of growing up. Pause. That is one loaded sentence. Loaded, loaded. It looks, it sounds, remember I said, language is fascinating, language is intriguing, language is also a tool. So when we're talking about being equipped with knowledge and resources, which knowledge and which resources to make what right choices? And for who? For yourself. Forget those people called parents. They'll, you know, forget it. Right now the law is, is saying we, we can give our children access to sexual health services without the consent of children. And if the doctor, we have to put things in place so that if there is litigation, parents, the doctor, the doctor is protected. That's the world we live in. Okay? It continues. Dance for Life exists to create a safe space for young people. When you hear anything about a safe space and health, just ask yourself, what's going on? Do they really mean a safe space? Are they really talking health? A safe space for young people to generate healthy, positive relationships with their bodies. What does that mean, people? Could you tell me, Pastor David? <laughs> Could you tell me, Pastor Paris? Bishop Paris? Tell me. Anybody knows what it means to have a healthy relationship with your body? Okay. Can I make a suggestion? There was one guidance counseling book and it was talking about masturbation and it said to the children, before you masturbate, wash your hands and clip your fingernails. That's a healthy relationship with your body. Now I don't know what dance for life means, but this is what they have said. So it's, it's a real toss up. And I, I would just love the Ministry of Education to tell me what they are telling me. So let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Next slide, please. Give them the benefit of the doubt. And if there's any doubt, there was a school survey around the same time as that um, IDB computer, that devious computer test that was no computer test that had the embedded social survey. And this, they didn't make a big noise of this, 
but this happened, okay? And it's not just one school. So there were 35 questions, and I am so glad because at Family Faith Freedom, we downloaded the survey and we kept it. Because by the time we went back to the survey, it was gone. Yeah. But I got it, and I gave it to the media too. All right, so here they had 35 questions. It's multiple choice, and, and you did. So here are questions for your children at school. Remember, we're looking at the role of today's child in tomorrow's church, and we're trying to see what kind of world do these children live in because knowledge is power, and if we know the world they live in, we know how we can intervene, correct? Yeah. So you're following me, or, or you think we go on off track? Tell me, people. All right. So here are the questions. Question three. What is your gender? Male, female, other. Okay? Question 11, and these are only some that I really, really object to. And I know where these come from, because guess what? I worked on a survey with adults from different sectors, and these verbatim are the questions that we asked. These questions were meant for adults, not for 12 and 13 year olds, not for teenagers. Question 11, can you always tell on your own if you or your partner has an STI? This is a child you're asking, you know. Question 16, how old were you when you had sex for the first time? Question 17, during your life, how many people have you had sex with? Question 18. How many people did you have sex with in the past 90 days? And they know that our children ain't so good at math. So they say, well, when we say 90 days, we mean three months. Question 19. Did you drink alcohol or use drugs before you had sex the last time? Question 20. The last time you had sex. Did you or your partner use a condom? Your children went to school and your children were asked these questions. In the Q&A, I would like to hear your thoughts on those questions. Next slide, please. So the question is, who is teaching these children? We want them to have an ideal role in tomorrow's church. But so far, it ain't looking so good because the people that are teaching them they ain't seem to be teaching them too good. And guess what? Do I dare, do I dare ask for a show of hands? How many of you know or when your children were small, how many of you had family devotions regularly? How many of you took your neighbor's children? How many of you had little Bible clubs and so on? Who's teaching our children? What are they learning at home? The TV is on and we're talking TV and we're talking WhatsApp and we're talking news. Do we talk God at home? Or do we just leave it for Sunday school? And what is happening in Sunday school? Are our Sunday schools as structured? Do they have the kind of curriculum that would help in a situation like this? Are we really serious? Are our youth groups teaching our children about the Word of God? Or are we just teaching them how to have fun? How to go on a cruise? You know, we give them fish cakes and samosas and whatnot. And we just have fun, calm, done. That is what Christianity looks like in some churches. Some time ago, I had reason to contact tons and tons of pastors from tons and tons of denominations, from tons and tons of churches, and talk with them. And guess what? 
so many of them don't have youth groups in their church. A lot of youth groups, especially after COVID, nil. No youth group. So we have, we know who's teaching them on social media. We know who's teaching them um, under the guise of all kinds of things, including dance and computer tests. Do we teach them ourselves? Are they learning enough in Sunday school? Are they learning enough in VBS? Are they learning enough at home? Who is teaching them? Recently, there was a hullabaloo that 62% of Barbadians say they have no religion. So count them out. We have 38% who can teach the young people. But of that 38%, you have different faiths. And of those who even have Jesus as central, there are those who don't believe the Bible. I am tired of hearing Christians say, that doesn't sound like the God I know. You know? This doesn't sound like the, and God would do this, and God would do that. And the other day I asked somebody, I said, God is a God of love. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of justice. Do you know he's a God of wrath? You know that? He's still a God of wrath. John, John 3, 16 says, God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And go down to 36 and tell me what it says. That if you don't believe God, you don't have the son, you don't have life, but the wrath of God dwells. It remains with you. So, we have a limited number of persons teaching our children. There are 88 primary schools in the country. 67%, 57% of them don't even have an ISCF group. There are 21 government secondary schools. 29% don't have an ISCF. And of those that do have, many of them are struggling. Struggling. Why? Where are the Christian teachers? Where are the Christian retired persons who could go and even if it's once a month? So while those places, and, and you, if you were to look there, you'd see a good little curse word and so. So while these filthy groups have 900 people in it, the ISCF groups don't exist, and those that exist have two and three and four and five, and you can count them on, on your hands. Is that good enough, people? We've got to do something. It can't be, be business as usual. Our children are looking to us. Next slide. They want us to teach them the good stuff. You know, I swim. And sometimes we swim out to the boats, but there's a boy, there a life boy, and you know, we go in up to there. We ain't passing. You know, it's nice to have boundaries. It's nice to know how far you can go. And although our children kick up against the boundaries, they need those boundaries, and they appreciate those boundaries because they are safe in those boundaries. So we have to set the boundaries. They, we, they want us to teach them. Teach me how to forgive, to care, to trust, to obey. In a sense, the children are being taught to question and to think critically. And they're being taught, your parents are not always right, which is true, your parents ain't always right. But what do you mean by telling my six-year-old that? You know? So we have to intervene, for. We have to intervene. Next slide. Watch out. Because if we don't intervene, the few of us here, watch here, you having a whole lecture, a whole lecture to honor Raymond Ford, and the place not even full. How many residents you have in Barbados? Huh? Enough to fill this church? All right then. So you get the point. 
So those of us who are interested enough, we have a lot of work to do because our children get to adulthood, to late teenage years, if they get there, broken. We don't want them like that. Next slide. And there are those who will come for our children. Our children, they're ripe for the picking. If we don't do the picking, somebody else will. And so far, they've been doing a grand job. I have been to a church to talk about abortion, and if you hear the questions coming at me from our nice little safe children, they don't believe that abortion is a sin. They don't believe you know what they call it now? It's not a fetus or embryo or anything. It's the product of conception. That's what they call it. So little by little, our children have been fed all kinds of things. And if we don't pick them when they are ready, if we don't grab that 62% that gets saved as children, you see what's going to happen to them. So they're broken or they're just no good, no good at all. So the question is, what can we do? Next slide. And what we can do is recognize that it is not business as usual. We've got to intervene. One, in terms of the church as an organization, we have to look at our children's ministry. Children's ministry is not just something you do because, well, you know, you're doing one for the, the single women and one for the men, so let's do one for the children. The money that you're putting to your missionary offering, put some for your children. Take the children seriously and have a firm curriculum for Sunday schools. Know from Sunday to Sunday and be faithful if you are a Sunday school teacher. Don't just Saturday night do a quick, quick thing and get up Sunday and talk all over your face. The children can read right through you. Prepare, be faithful. Not just Sunday school, but youth meeting. Um, I don't know how many of you saw the production speak life and there was a, a scene with a youth meeting and you should have heard that youth leader chatting all kind of nonsense you know the politically correct nonsense but thank god there was a young person who said no this is not what the bible says so we have to be careful with our youth meeting careful with who we put in charge of our youth meeting and have accountability you know, do a regular audit, call in your youth leaders and ask them about themselves. Look, I mean, ask them all kinds of intrusive questions. IDB did it to our children, you can do it to your youth workers, okay? Find out if they need help. Are you being tempted? You're living right? Whenever I meet somebody that I haven't seen for a long time, they know one of the questions I ask them, how are you and the Lord? How are you and the Lord? Just yesterday was, I asked somebody, and he said, no, it was Sunday. Okay, so it was on Friday. And he said, oh, I come back. And I was so glad. So, so, so ask people to hold people accountable. Then vacation by the school and by the clubs and make vacation by the school attractive and make it free. Don't charge people, children. They have stuff to do to buy books and so on and uniforms. Make it free and give them food too. You know, shift, paradigm shift. Then camps. A lot of children also get saved in camps. ISCF, ISCF is struggling. It's struggling with money, it's struggling with personnel. In admin, it's struggling with personnel in the schools. I mean, don't we really care? Do we care? Do we really, really care? Do we have any time for our children? 
Can we invest in IV, ISCF? If we can't give our time, can we give our money? But guess what? I greedy. I want us to give our time and our money. So we can't do that. And I would say, let's have some family devotions and some old-fashioned Bible clubs. Even if it's two children you get or three children, just every now and then, talk with them, read the word to them because they're not getting it sometimes in even in their own homes. But intentionally look at the children. Next slide, please. So, and then soon we get into the role of children. We want you to indoctrinate them. That's my suggestion. Indoctrinate your children. The devil indoctrinating them. Why you can't indoctrinate them? It's not a curse word. Indoctrinate them. I was in South Africa and I had these two Muslim friends that were wonderful to me. And we went in the afternoon and this lady was picking up her grandson. He's about six or seven. She picked him up from school, and then she drops him off to wheel. Tell me where she dropped. The, the little boy spent the whole day in school, but she dropped him off. And he is learning the Quran. But we lovely Christians, we say, oh, they're tired. Oh, they can't do this, and they can't do that. And we're not teaching them the Bible verses that will stay in their head so when they're ready to do wrong, they hear that Bible verse. How many of us are teaching our children anything about the Bible? Why can't they learn the Bible just like the Muslims take their little, little ones? When I was guidance counselor at Queen's College, it was wonderful to see. I walked into a classroom and the Muslim walked out of the classroom. They don't want to hear anything to, that I have to say. It wasn't about me. It was that their parents were protecting them from this thing called guidance counseling, and I don't want my child in that. And I respected that. How many of us will stand up when they're teaching foolishness in health and family life education, the sexuality part, the comprehensive sexual education? How many of you will go and pull your children out and say to your children, you don't want to be a part of that, come out of the thing. So we want to indoctrinate our children. The world bullies us and the world tells us, oh, don't tell your children, um, don't impose your values. So they, so they tell us, don't impose your values. But where do we get, what's happening here? Yeah. Where do we get our thing from? Listen to what the Bible says. Yeah, okay, thank you. That must be the devil. <laughs> okay, so here, here we're talking about indoctrination and then we're done. Indoctrinate your children. Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 9, and I'm gonna read it in four versions. So don't get tired, babies. Don't get tired, people. I'm going to read it for you. The good old King James says, And these words, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently. How? How to teach them? On and off? Today and then next week? No. Teach them diligently unto thy children, and hear the indoctrination that the world tell us you don't want to impose on your children. And shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house, and on thy gates. Does that sound like indoctrination? Yeah. So, so to me, hear what the NIV says. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. 
when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. What is that called? What is called? Indoctrination. And who is telling us to indoctrinate our children? No less than the sovereign God. So we go and listen to these international agencies and to these lawyers who are atheist allies that say, take the prayers out of school and don't impose on your children. Hear how, hear how the New Living Translation puts it. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I give you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands. Wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Put on your dress sleeve. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And then the radical message. No, I like the message, right? It ain't no good for doctrine. But for understanding, it's nice. So the message says, write these commandments that I've given you today on your hearts. Get them inside of you. And then get them inside of your children. Talk about them wherever you are, sitting at home or walking in the street. Talk about them from the time you get up in the morning to when you fall into bed at night. Tie them on your hands and foreheads as a reminder. Inscribe them on the doorposts of your homes and on your city gates. So, what is the ideal role, next slide, what is the ideal role of today's child in tomorrow's church? I would like to suggest to you that they be honorable MPs. That's, that's the role. We want them to be persons of integrity. People like Raymond Ford and people like all the folks you gave me. You know, we want them to be honorable. We want them to live lives of integrity, to be respectful. Not only to be respectful to others, but that others will respect them, to live the kind of lives that others will respect. To be people of honesty and sound ethics, to be sought, to be light, to be people who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Most of the time that I pray for young people, that's all I ask now. Say, Lord, give us young people that will hunger and thirst for righteousness. Because they're hungering and they're thirsting for Kentucky and Shepherd and for CSI and or, or, or everything else. But hunger and thirst for righteousness, they, they ain't too much there. So let them be honorable. And then what's that M? Let them be magnets. Let them be you know, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul says, be followers of me as I'm a follower of Christ. Let them be magnets, that that integrity and that respect and that honesty and that light that is reflecting from them. I learned one thing from my daughter when she was doing physics, and she said that there are two kinds of light, one that is light itself and one that's just a reflection of the light. Well, we are a reflection of the true light, and when people see us, they should be drawn to the true light. So the role of tomorrow's children to be magnets and to be pillars in the church, a pillar makes something strong. But you know, some pillars are there definitely to make it strong, but they're also to make it attractive. I love to travel, I love to see old buildings, and if you see some of those old buildings and the kind of pillars, I mean, beautiful. So our children should be, ideally, we want them to be 
honorable, we want them to be magnets, we want them to be pillars in the church. And that can only happen if we take time now to shape them. Because God has given them to us, God has entrusted them to us, and we have that responsibility. Everything going away, don't even mind. I have here a cargo. It is old, it is rusty. I have had it. Yeah. I have had this cargo for over 20 years. And it says, next slide, it says, amazing how we can light today with tomorrow. Let us light our children's lives today. Every time you see a child, consider what is their role. I want them to be an honorable MP in tomorrow's church. What can I say to them? No. Even if it's a smile, whatever. What can I do right now? How can I invest in this child's life so that they can be an honorable MP in tomorrow's church. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Evelyn. And now is the opportunity that we are going to open the floor to, um, for you to use your, your for you to use your questions. And I must um, ask your forgiveness in that I did not forewarn you that this polished, beautiful woman is a stepping razor. She pulls no punches. She deals with the situation uh, straight up. A woman that loves God and delivers as God places it in her heart. So we want to encourage you now to... Um, to have our, to, 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 to share your questions, I'm going to be the first one out, uh, leading the way, and I have a question for you. That's out. So my question, you might say, Church addressing sex, sexuality, and the issues confronting uh, our children in their real life situation. I ask this question because I know that even from primary school level, there are children exposed to it. Uh, I, I, I ask this question because I know that even at primary school level, there are children exposed to all sorts of things. And we at church, some of us, when we have them for Sunday school, we have them for one hour. Some teachers have them for the, for the entire week. But I, I'm asking this question in the framework also, the Wesleyan Church, we have um, issued our child protection policy. And what, what, how, what is your advice regarding this? Because some children, some children are not taught or, or the right things about, about sex and sexuality and they are open to television and to some very serious people that want to harm them. Yes, yes please. Um, the Bible tells us that every scripture is given for correction, la, 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 instruction in righteousness. So the Bible has the answers. And we have to be honest with our children. Don't talk on Nancy's story with them. Speak the truth. Speak it plainly. Speak it within the context of the Word of God. And I, I don't know how many times I've been saying this for years and years. As a matter of fact, there was a time when I had books and I gave different churches a whole curriculum. We have to teach our children the Word of God and apply it. So you talk about Tamar and who got raped and how Absalom hid. Who 
who said that hated her as much as he hated her her just after they had sex as much as he loved her before. That's a wonderful thing to teach your young people. But you know, use the word of God and use topical things. What's happening, the, the laws that are being passed, what's going on in their school, talk with them. How was school today? I remember talking with someone and these little children in Heidelberg, in primary school, after lessons, they would play a game. The play, the game was called hide and sex. Okay? Primary school. Hide and sex. So, you know, we, we're too naive. We're kind of naive. We know it's happening, but we ain't touching it. Our children understand sex. And for those who don't know, you know if your children are nice and innocent and, and don't know, but follow them, but teach them. Because if you don't, and I have been saying this to my son, my son has a son, seven, three, and a little girl. And from the time they was three, four, I said, Chris, you've got to talk to this child before the people talk to him in school because he's going to hear it anyway. So you need to talk with your children and with children that you have the authority over. Talk with them about sex. Tell them not to let anybody touch them here, there, and so on. Tell them about their private parts. Tell them about sex, what's a penis, what's a vagina, how God made man and woman different, and what it's for, and how babies are formed. The birds and the bees, forget that. Forget the birds and the bees. Talk, real talk. It's not a sin. It's not a sin to say sex or vagina or penis. It's a sin not to say it and let your children go. They are an and use everything, you know? So I think we just need to get our act together in the Sunday schools, and like I say, the ISCF needs to be a force in the schools because you have social studies, biology, geography, uh, what do you call the word that's near to it? Human and social biology. You have health and family life education. And in all of these, you have, I, I see it like termites, you know? So they're learning about evolution, and they're learning that, you know, this universal thing, and the force, and mindfulness, and the answers are within you. They're learning all kinds of stuff at school. We need the ISCF to be strong and vibrant. We need every Christian teacher to be on their guard and to recognize that when they go into the school, they are an undercover agent for God. We need each Christian principal to be unapologetically Christian. I have seen some Christians in high places, and I said, oh wait, you, God put you this place so you could be salt and light and you chatting the same foolishness as the people in darkness. We need to get our act together. That's all. Thank you, Dr. Even. Next question. If you have a question, you can come here to the microphone uh, up at the table. So you're free to come and ask your questions. Let's keep it flowing this evening, people. Philosopher Aristotle says, 
if you give me a child until he is seven, I will show you the man. And you said some things about the church that we get into things that, you know, we're not really doing what we're supposed to do. And it seems to me that the world has infiltrated the church. We are now practicing what the world preach rather than the world practicing what we preach. Because even with our children where the word of God says that we should spare not the rod and spoil the child, we today have turned it around. I don't hit my child, I just give them a look. My parents never give me a look yet. They just cut my behind and I fall in line. And my parents had 14 children and none of us ever went to jail. And they never had any issues. My father had one me. In this house there's only one buck rack and that's me. If you want to be a man, find your own place. And today, I have noticed that our children are given free reign from as young as two and three to not just make choices, but to run the roost. He is the man in here and she's the woman in here. And we do not realize that when we make statements like that, that five, ten years down the road, that those children are going to be the ones ruling us. So my question to you is how, as parents and as a church, can we take back our homes and our children where what God originally intended for us to do can be fully put in place? Good, good question. Um, not only do we say he's the man of the house and she's the man, they actually call the children little man. Little man. You know? Um, how can we take back our children? First of all, recognize that the children belong to us. I like to say we got to get to learn how to mind people's business. I don't mean to gossip. I don't mean to gypsy. But we must mind each other's business. We must care about each other. The Bible says rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those that weep. And it means we must know what's going on in people's lives. And all the little children, as long as they are around you, whether it's your neighbor's children or they at the bus stop outside your house, or you see them at the market, wherever you see a child, have a vested interest in that child. Consider that God put them there for that moment for you to invest in. And if you can be with them along the way, Go along the way with them. Adopt. You don't have to do it through the child care board, but just just find some children, anybody, anybody at all, and say, I'm going to take an interest in this child. I'm going to buy their uniform, and if I don't have money, I'm going to invite them to lunch with me. I'm going to take them out. I'm going to take them to church with me. Just adopt a child in your mind. Make up your mind and walk alongside because a lot of parents of today are the troublesome children of yesterday. They don't have a clue what they're doing. Walk along with a parent. Teach a parent. Find a young person. If everybody here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, etc., etc., if each person were to take one child, that you don't know from Adam, or that you do know from Adam, maybe a family member, but there must be some child somewhere that you can embrace, and don't embrace them for a moment. There's a verse, Hosea 6, 4, and for years upon years upon years, that verse impresses itself upon me because it is what I see. And the Lord said, Oh Judah, what shall I do with thee? What shall I do? I learned it from the King James. What shall I do with thee, O Israel? For thy goodness is as a morning cloud, and like the early dew, it goeth away. And that is us Christians, flashing the pan. We can't stay with anything for too long. Stay with a child. I think of one young lady who now has on board justice, Shamel. I think she, is she a wizard? And she talks about 
Right, and she talks about this gentleman who paid school fees and who, who you know, guided. He didn't just do it once and stop. Right through. We need persons who will walk alongside children. Children need stability in their lives. I went to the yacht club one Christmas and I was just so angry, angry, angry. Because, you know, the yacht club and they, they have the children from the children's homes. And I said, what is this? They can come in here at Christmas and you can give them gifts. But that's it. See you next year. You know, see you next year. No. Go find, find a child. Find a parent who's struggling and help them. If you don't have the money, if you don't have anything, you have time, you have the word of God. Love somebody enough to walk with them right through childhood, year after year after year. That's how it will make the difference. Does that answer your question? coming up 
Get them involved. Get them involved in everything. Because they don't know a thing. Get them involved. Get them. There's a church I'm going to in Cayman. And there's this little girl, and she's too sweet. And she will just get up from her parents, and she go on up to the altar. And she think, you know, leave her alone. I enjoy that. So let the children come and let them do their little dance and so on. But when they get to a little older and they understand, stop it. Because they're jolly well known, they ain't saved. And if they ain't saved, is God accepting that from them? Huh? They're only performing. And if they want to perform, let them go somewhere else and perform, not in church. So don't let them be singing and leading worship and, and they have not had an encounter with Christ. We've, we've got to be careful. Now, in youth meetings where you have debates and so on, let them, let them be involved. It takes discretion, it takes the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will lead. But be very, very prayerful about the parameters for involving older, sensible children who have not made a profession of faith. But when it comes to the little sweethearts down there, let them feel active because that will engage them. And, and for the older ones as well, and let them know, let them know, yes, you can do X or Y, but you ain't getting up there because you need to make a personal profession of faith in Christ. Good evening, Dr. Ethan. How are you doing? Thank you, sir. <laughs> you did a great job, I think, suppose you would have. And I think you touched a lot of areas which I would not go over. I want to preface my question, though, with, by making the point that that young gentleman who just sat down years ago, he was my Sunday school teacher. Okay. And I, it was people like him who impacted my life to the point where at this point in time I am saved Amen. and I am serving the ministry. And I think that ought to say something or ought to resonate in terms of what you said earlier. Because I think what we are witnessing in church is a situation where many of the mothers and the fathers and those individuals who are involved in our lives that element is very much missing in church. Mm -hmm. And so it is easy for an individual to come into church, a child to come into church, and not even be recognized. Mm -hmm. right? And I think that that is evident in most of our churches. Another point that I would make very quickly is from the history of the blessing on this church, I know for a fact that many of our churches began all the Sunday schools. It started as a Sunday school. It started as a ministry to children in the community and eventually became a church. And that shows you the power of ministering to children. My, I've been serving uh, in ministry with the youth for over 16 years now across the Caribbean. And youth ministry has impacted me a lot. I'm serving as a pastor now. But one of the biggest issues that I realize, or one of the biggest problems that I realize, I don't know if you would read, you can tell me if you read it as well, is that there are probably persons that I see who are preventing their children a lot of times from giving their heart to the Lord are Christian parents. Oh, you know, it, it hurts. It hurts. Political correctness. We want to be sophisticated. We don't want to impose. We want to give them a chance. We will tell them they can't eat the corn curls because it ain't good for them. But we're not telling them you can't watch this terrible movie because it's bad for you. So, You're right. So my question really and truly was, how do you empower again Christian parents to be able to uh, I guess in, in the, a word that I would, I would use here is how do you empower them again to 
make the right decision related to their children in terms of salvation because that is a big issue for me. I, I can tell you of a scenario that I have a to went through, whereas the child went through corporate class and all of that, but when it was time to, to the child to get back to the parents said no. And that was the first time. And I've watched, and that child, for all the rest of the years that I knew that child, that child came to church. Participated, as you said earlier, but never would give his life to the Lord. And so it is very, very hard even being able to impact that child at this stage, even. So that, that question, that my question is born out of that. How could we empower parents? Parents. How do we get over to Christian parents? And you use the word doctrine earlier. I love the term. I'm not, I'm not scared of it. I think we need to use it. Uh, how do we and how do we turn the tide where that is concerned? That's one question. And the second question is a very serious question. I want to ask you if you believe that the church has failed. Okay, that's, that's a hard question, that is easy. Yes, I believe with all my heart that the church as an organization has failed. We've become a social club. That's all. Health and wealth. God is our pal. You know? He's our pal, he's our genie. So we rub the lamp and he comes up and he says, I'll give you three wishes and you say, Heal my relationship, heal my cancer, heal my diabetes, give me money to buy this land, give me this car, and God is give, 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 get, 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 get. And then there are false people who have gone out among us, the Bible says so. They call themselves, they have appointed themselves, God ain't appoint them. And they are leading churches and they are leading them astray. When you go home, go to Ezekiel, right? And like 37, 38, 39 and so. It's terrible. God called Ezekiel. He said, Ezekiel, come here. Let me show you something. And he showed Ezekiel. And then he said, you think that's bad? Come showed him some more. He said, no, 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 that ain't bad. Come and see. And God got so fed up of the priest. He says, listen, I don't do it myself because you people, you are helping me. You are pushing the people away from me. Like the disciples pushed away the children from mothers of Salem when they brought their children. Yes, I believe that the church as an organis organization has failed. I think that we are also very lazy. Christians are some of the laziest people I have seen with the poorest work ethic I have seen. And when I say Christians are talking, remember? Remember I tell you, it's not a word I use without qualification. I'm not talking Bible-believing Christians. I'm talking nominal Christians. And some Bible-believing Christians, and here I get to your other question, sir. You can't power a soul. You can't. You cannot. I think of some of us Christians in the organization, the social club, the religious club, and you're pushing like wheelbarrows, and you're pulling teeth, and you're having seminars, and you're doing everything, and you're trying to empower them, you can't empower them. You know why? There's one thing you can do, and I beg you, Pastor David, and I beg you, Pastor, how do you pronounce your name? Paris, right. I beg you, and I beg every pastor that will hear me, take some time on a Sunday in your services. Remind the people to read the Bible. Amen. How many people have devotions? How many people read their Bible from one Sunday to the next? 
How many people teach their children? They do not know the word of God. There are 66 books in the Bible. How many do we know? How many have we read? You go to church, the, Bible, the pastor can't even read six verses because it's too long. And the people have a short attention span. But guess what? Ezra read for Odin and the people stood up. We have just become so lazy. Really, really lazy. And God has become our pal. And so we don't, the God we serve is just a shadow of our imagination. We need to get back to the word of God. And that is how, that's the only thing we can do to empower parents. Which is why I say, give us a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. There are Christian parents. Listen, they will send their children to dancing. They'll send them to swimming and netball and this and that. But they ain't spending 10 minutes reading the word of God with them. There are Christian parents that don't open the Bible at home. So... If the parents ain't reading the word of God and they go to church and they're hearing a little and the pastor says, and we could just do verses 1 to 5 for lack of time. What are you telling me? Foolishness? You come to church and you're telling me about lack of time for reading the word of God? What lack of time? Wait, what are you using the time for? If you come to church and it's not to read the word of God, and it's just to tell me some story. You keep your story. Give me the word of God. And then, if you're going to give me a half-baked sermon, please put it back in the oven. We have failed. We need the word of God. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to your word? And if we don't know the word, it's not just the young people. If, if Christians don't know the word, except the little bit that they get. And guess what? The pastors preach the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. So we, we fairly well know what's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, right? We know some of the stories in Genesis. We have a kind of overview of Exodus. We're not quite so sure about Leviticus and we stumble. We get into Deuteronomy, let's skip over that. Deuteronomy, Joshua, well, Judges, um, Judge. Oh, we know about Ruth um, and, and Samson, yeah. And we go on and on. Ah, Kings and Chronicles, what are those books? Uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, Jonah, Zephaniah, Zechariah. You know anything about them? Habakkuk, Haggai, Joel, Nahum. You can't even find it in your Bible. And Revelation, that's too frightening. Don't forget it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so all we know is a little bit a little image, a little shadow of a God who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so we hear. But we're not so sure about Jesus Christ. The answer is the word of God. That's all. Right. <laughs> yes, please. We have uh, one, two more persons. For, for questions, I mean, just let us know. I forewarned you, I forewarned you without being familiar. She is a Polish sword. Polish sword. Serious. Go ahead. Good evening, Dr. Good evening. Thank you for the very informative presentation. And thank you for all your help. This is Melva Weeks. Ah? Huh? Okay, this, okay, so this is the Honorable MP, Melvin Week. She's an Honorable MP of today. Yeah, she really helped me a lot. Every time I had a question, it was over to her. Go ahead. And of course, Pastor. Yeah. No, of course not. <laughs> it was my pleasure to assist. Thank you. Yes, please. I have a question that was sent in. 
Um, the person indicated we are focusing on children, but children do not live in a vacuum and their families will need to be engaged. What are we doing to capture the parents so they can see value in what we are seeing, thereby making it easier for the children to accept what we offer and they get the impression that these are unsafe parents that this person is referring to. Which is why I say we've got to be smart. Smarter, you know, because look, it's summer. The parents want to get rid of their children. Welcome the children. Tell them they can come, you know, and give them some food to make it nice. Because you're helping the parents. And you cannot get over the value of relationship. No relationship costs. It costs in time, it costs in money, it costs in listening, it costs in the shoulder that you're lending, but come alongside somebody. And, you know, I don't know. It's where I stand and it's, it's what I've experienced in my life. So I might be a little cynical and a little skeptical and a little everything wrong, right? Which is why I say, take everything I say with a pinch of salt. But some, some Christian parents are almost a hopeless cause, hopeless case. Until they get to the word of God, that's where we start. The programs are not sufficient unless embedded in that program is the word of God. I went recently to a cake, uh, a bread making class, a bread making class. Now, I make my own bread anyway, but I went because I wanted a little fellowship. And at the beginning of that bread making class, so everybody want to make bread, you know, but at the beginning, we're talking and we're praying and you can bring in Jesus is the bread of life and what is, you know, so that all of our programs must not just be programs external to the Word, but there must be programs in which the Word is integral. Focus on Christ, not on the program. Focus on Christ. Get a Word in for Christ. When I meet people, you know, at wherever I meet them, I say, if you're serving the Lord, serve him with all your heart. And if you don't know him, seek him with all your heart. And that usually starts the conversation. Name the name of Jesus Christ. When you see people, just ask the Lord, how can I get Christ into this conversation? Now, be warned. People might get sick of you, tired of you. You will be called self-righteous and bigoted, and you think, you know, it's all, all kinds of everything, but don't mind. You have not yet resisted unto blood, fighting against sin. Speak the word. Speak the word. Apply the word. Just, I have this vision, right? This vision of a Caribbean that is just where, where the Caribbean is filled with the knowledge of God, like the waters cover the sea. So people in their t-shirts mark Jesus, and on their car they have on the, the, the posters mark Jesus, and they get a bus stop, and they put something with Jesus there, and you go to a doctor's office, and he has this mirror that says, what matters is how God sees you in his bathroom, you know? And you go into a Christian store. I like to go into Upbeat and Shelter. They always play some nice Christmas Christmas. You imagine if all the Christians would play some Christian music at, in, the, in the stores. And if we would just, you know, you have a nice little something on your desk saying something and just Flood the place, flood the place with Jesus so nobody can, can get away. That would be wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I have another question, and it relates to our children's story. Um, 
Now, generally speaking, in church, and this has been happening from the time I was a youth, our children would come in and they would be a part of Sunday school. But from the minute they become teenagers, they disappear. My question is, I know you will have spoken a little to it, but my question is, how do we capture them and keep them with us? Can you enlarge upon that? We spoke earlier about making the ministry more attractive, but can you expand a little more on that? How do we make it so compelling to them that they don't want to leave us? They choose to stay with us. How do we make it so compelling? How do we persuade people to serve Christ? How do we empower people? One, like I say, I don't believe we can empower them. We can do so much and no more, but we have a duty to do all that we can. And I think the most compelling testimony is our lives. Our lives, you know, are we authentic? Are we one thing at church and, and another thing at home? Do our children see Christ in us? They criticize us, yes, oh Lord God. Do they criticize us? But at the end of the day, do they see Christ in you? Can they find Christ? It might not be now, it might be after there's one person I'm thinking, and her mother was there at 29 years, she was living all kinds of ways, but then she came back to Christ. You know, so that one, let's have a paradigm shift. And let us do what's possible and leave the impossible to God. Our job is to bring people to Christ, to be the magnets, and to be the pillars, and so on. But yeah, our job to save them, nor keep them. It's not our job to save them, nor keep them. That is God's business. But it is our job to support them and to be a pillar, a shoulder, a hand, etc. And that's what we need to do. Our lives, we just got to be available. That's it. Be available. Be the word. Uh, Dr. Evelyn, yes. uh, with our pastor's um, permission, we want to indulge us for a few more questions. We understand that we've been speaking for a long time. So we have a few more questions, some people we want to, to share. So That's you, okay. Okay, thank Word you so much. God, thank you so much. God. All right. And, and, and the audience, we, 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 we do indulge your uh, patience with us. Wait. But hold on. This is my husband, people. He can ask me any question I want. <laughs> <laughs> you taking up the people time. He's speaking to us, Dr. Evelyn. No way to Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm not answering the question. I want to just make um, two suggestions about something that I said. Um, first, we mentioned. Uh, yesterday, I remember there was a time when we used to actually help support ISCF financially. And what I would suggest is that churches can actually can actually take on the adoption of one yes. or two free workers. And I think since your our entire organization could decide this and we will fund, support, pay the salaries, mm -hmm. right? every month for one or two free workers and get them into specific schools. Um, we hold on to the money that we have as if it is ours to be used in the service of God. And I tell you this, when Christ comes, the churches in this world are going to have billions of dollars sitting down in the banks. When that money should be we are working to get the gospel of Jesus Christ going. Um, a few years ago, we used to hear a lot about Al Qaeda, right? And one of the things I learned about them is in Britain and other places, those places will have what I call cells. Men would open businesses, and those businesses were open to fund terror, terrorism. 
bombing, killing, destroying, right? And there's nothing wrong with this one. And this is to support Christian causes and to get the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, definitely. And then the next point I would mention is, earlier you mentioned about the kids. Um, the men in here, I'd like to challenge a few men that are here, is there's so many things. So once I went to my pastor and offered to mentor children who had no fathers. They're not a single parent women trying to raise boys. And if you know, a woman can do her part, but if you can't completely raise a boy, you don't even understand how boys think, right? Um, we think that you ladies get offended with boys. Most men would not even get offended about, right? And I think the time has come where we have to step in there and help these women to raise their boys. It may be a little expensive sometimes. I took on three of them, they were cousins. And so I took them our stock riding to take them out. I organized with a friend of mine who was a retired teacher to give one lessons. Then as he started to grow and he's on vacation, um, sometimes he will come in, I'm not like, I'm self-employed by the way, and everybody may not be able to do this. I'm not like to come with you today, say yes. So he goes up and spend a whole day with me at work, right? And in that way, I was able to, to have a relationship with him, right? And you women can do the same thing too. There are maybe women who have young girls and they're struggling trying to raise these children. You are taking your own children up, you know, some child from the village with you to a picnic, carry them shopping, whatever, and make these children feel as if somebody care and somebody love them. And lastly, my last daughter has just adopted a little boy. It is funny in life. Um, when he is, sometimes, yes. sometimes, you get that. No identifying details. <laughs> Some, sometimes we see things, this one said it's funny, and we can react to things differently. I was driving one day coming out to Sheraton Center, and you know where uh, FedEx had their cars, and I saw a woman and a child begging. And I got I got mad and vexed about it, and decided, you know, vex the woman I want to and tell her off. My daughter passed and saw the same thing, but her response was so different to mine. She parked her car and went to talk to the woman, and ended up now adopting one of her children, right? Now that child comes home with me and I, you know, we play tennis together, we play uh, cricket together, sometimes um, just to the rest of my house. And right now I am planning to buy two table tennis rackets because I beat him in every game, right? <laughs> like most in the city is the best of everything, right? So my plan is to buy two table tennis rackets and try to find the time to go someplace to play table tennis with them. So I'm saying to the men that you can do the same thing. Look for some child in your district, whatever, and you can adopt that child and make uh, an uh, important mark in his life and it would never end. I just said last thing, one last thing. One of our, my former pastors is in the island right now. Those men took us as youngsters and they mentored us. They taught us how to preach. Um, they took us to be on a missionary journey. They went to um, that place up by the airport, out in the cotton field. These are the pastors I am talking about. No, I don't know if I can offend anybody. Nowadays when you see a pastor, he wants you to walk into the church with his Bible. I don't know whether your woman will want to surrender his sword to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> these men at that time, right? They took us and they mentored us. A few years ago, one of them were, I can't remember, it came to Barbados after being invited in, but we rented the Methodist Hall in Maxwell, and we honored that man when he was living. Right now he's in Barbados, and I already got a call. I got a call from a backslider who called me, and then we have to do something about Pastor Nathan. And we know I organized something for him this week. But listen to who called me a backslider, you know what? Because that man has made an important input yes. 
into his way. And whether he is serving God or not, he wants to honor that man. And I'm saying that we need to put him and put into people's ways and those marks will stay with him forever. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes, we will disagree on certain things, but we need to come to a compromise where we have established standards in terms of what is acceptable, what we would, um, in terms of, for example, like you were saying in worshiping um, the children at a certain age you cut it off, what is acceptable in the host of God for your host as a pastor? I think we need to come to some level where we have a commonality that everybody recognizes this is a standard. Because with children, when they don't see a standard, if I say to you, this is, you can't do this, but when I look over here and the other person is telling me, I can't do this, but I don't say what? They can do anything, God. They got a standard. Children are very clever. And they recognize it's like a child with two parents. That's mommy tell me I can't do it. And daddy tell me I can't do it. They will work that. So I think that even within the church, I don't know what you think. I think that we have to have certain standards. Those are my humble submissions. Okay. And there were very good submissions. And I have them written down here. Um... <clears throat> Let's start where you just left off with standards. Remember we talked about Christians and then Bible believing Christians? The Bible is our standard. We don't need any other standard. The Bible is our standard, full stop. We can find the principles in God's word. When it comes to teaching our children and so on, and even this whole thing with support. The, the thing is, as Christians in the organized church, as nominal Christians in the organized religious club, which we call the church, we ain't even smart. Because everybody is in their own little enclave. So that you have however many 80 something thousand uh, Christians in Barbados, but everybody is short of resources, and everybody has their own program, half their program. When you could come together and do something real solid, we don't support each other. There isn't that, you know, so that we have the Wesleyans and the Nazarenes and the Baptists and the this and the that and the other. But what about just the church? What about if pastors got together across denominations and they said, hey, where, where are we taking the church in Barbados next year? And how are we going to do it? And what common activities will we have? And when will we have it? Because you have activities and everybody else having some other activity. So that we are not even efficient in what we do. We reduplicate things. We don't use our resources. Oh my, the Lord said it. My children destroyed for lack of knowledge. We are smart. ISCF, why should you, one soul teacher, why should you be carrying the whole of ISCF? Huh? 39 weeks in a year, the end, a half of 39 is how much people? 20, 19 and a half, but you can't have a half person, so 20. You don't have 20 teachers in a school and each could take it for one week, one day, one hour. You can't give one hour in a whole school year for the word of God and to teach children. We're not smart. We don't think long-term. We don't plan long-term. We're just always catching up, catching up. And we're running and we're running and we're tired and we're tired. But what? We're just running around in circles. We've got to get smart. And this is where I look to the pastors. And I have suggested that pastors also have an audit. A serious, serious, an integrity audit. Well, X, you know, often enough, you sit before your peers and they ask you, how is your marriage? 
How are you managing your sexuality? You're gambling, you're smoking, you're stealing. What about work? Have an integrity audit among the pastors. Have an integrity audit among your worship leaders, among your youth leaders, among your Sunday school teachers, among yourselves. I do my own personal integrity audits, right? That is why I said we have to mind each other's business. We have to know what's going on. We have to support one another. Not because we want to know your business, but we, because we want to shape you up and help you. Because God forbid, I have what I call an accountability posse. They don't even realize it. But they know themselves. And I remember when I was deciding after I'd done my studies for my PhD, and I was wondering if I were going back to Queen's College as a guidance counselor. And I knew that I, I, you know, all kinds of things, and what about my pension, and what about this, and what about that. And I went to my integrity posse, an older man, and a young man who was at university with me, and one of the strongest, bestest Christians I know. You know, have your own integrity posse, only recently, a, a young lady, she's in her 40s and, and struggling a bit with sexuality because she's single. And, and she says, you know, because I, I talk. <laughs> and she said, I don't mind. I'm accountable to you. Don't be afraid to ask me if I have fallen to temptation. And just the thought of knowing I'm going to ask, I bet you will help her not to. You know, hold people accountable. When you see people ask them, how is your marriage? I remember one Sunday we went to church and we had a wonderful service. And he real goes to service now. And then this girl came out and we talking and I said, so how are you and suppose her husband name is John? So how are you and John doing? And she started to cry. After the wonderful service we had at church. You understand what I mean? get to people, talk to people, and in terms of men, for me, it's simple, okay? I believe that a woman is a woman is a woman, and God made women, and we must be all that we can be, but God made man first, and he made man the head, and therefore, the men are important. The men should be the ones in church. Pastor Julie is a great pastor. But I don't think she should be, have to be no pastor. Where the men? Where is the men? Huh? On the block. At Dodds. In the rum shop. You know? We put so much burden on our women. And I, one time, the pastor asked me to speak in the men's Sunday school class. I said, Pastor, I can't do that. He says, yes, I want you to speak to the men. And I felt so awkward and everything. And we're talking about the men. And I said, the men, no, I believe, remember I tell you, I think a woman should be all that she can be. But if the man ain't growing, you won't be have so much headache because you're going to be putting against because the ceiling is so low. If the man isn't setting the ceiling high enough and you growing, 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 and he pressing down and you reach the top and, and you might break your neck. So the men have to get their act together. Everything upside down, we just ain't doing God's will, I don't know why. Because we don't know his word. The men are not being men. The men are not being the king and priest of their household. Full stop. You understand? The men need to be men. Let us women be us women. Don't put too much on us that we can't bear. Don't turn us into men. You be the man and let us be the woman. And let's live happily ever after. And we women have to learn to respect our men. It's hard. 
it is hard because when you're in control everywhere else, you want me in control at home. I guess my husband will say so too, right? Because you're in control everywhere else. So you have to remember now you go on home and he in control and I don't think he made any right decision. So all right, Arina, I'll do what you have to do, but I don't agree. You understand? So let us, it's simple. Let's just read the word of God, study the word of God, pray and support each other and be open and honest with each other. Don't be afraid to say, I have a problem. Don't be saying, oh, it's my business and I don't want nobody to know. When things happen, people will know in the end. Just, just love each other and live together and, and know each other's business and cry with each other and so on. And that's not rocket science, that's what the Bible says. Amen. Um, we have, we, we, we want to condense, so I just pass the, the final two. Quickly condense what you have to ask Dr. Eva. Uh, time is far spent, so we just want you to let's flow quickly. And, and then, following that, we will hear our vote of thanks, and I'll come back to you before our pastor speaks. Hello, me. Uh, I had well, two thoughts or questions. And, uh, the first one was kind of related to just now. Uh, I was thinking there's many churches, but not enough church. Um, when I was a child, I remember, even before my parents were saved, I had to go to church. Um, I believe the church then had a, the church as an organization had a good reputation. Yes. Because no matter whether you were saved or not, your child had to be in church. If it's one thing that's missing is that, um, People don't see church as it should be seen. And I don't know what we have to do as a body to change that, but it has to change because we are walking around with having the people you know, possible, you know, having the parents, but having power. It appears that that's what the children are not the only thing that are having problems. Marriages are having problems. Churches on the whole are having problems. We, we don't ever seem, the countries don't ever seem to seek the church of guidance anymore. When we look at the Bible, the, the Bible, you know, the prophet was the person that King saw. You know, nobody was seeking to hear guidance from God anymore because as far as they're concerned, it's, it's useless. And I think that's one of the things that we have to address. The other thing is, that the other question I had was, um, is it time that the evangelical churches consider um, having schools of their own, talkable, um, indoctrination? I mean, that's one way to do it. Um, we can't continue, especially with all the assaults, talk about the central comprehensive education and all these things that happen in schools that seem to go on the radar. And it's something that we seriously need to think about. We um, may seriously need to invest in because. As you mentioned, Muslims do it because um, they know that they're, they're teaching that they don't want to get across, that they will not be able to get across in the average school environment. So it's, that's just the two questions I have. Yeah, I think we should have schools if we can, although the way politics is going, they are going to mandate that we teach certain things. Right, but yes, we need Christian schools. But what's going to happen? The Wesleyans want their school, and the Nazarenes want their school, and the Baptists want theirs, and nobody has enough money, and you don't have enough teachers, and then you have half big schools. Why can't the pastors come together, see the need for a school, and have one really strong Christian school? and pool all our resources as children of Christ and have a proper school with proper teachers that you can pay well. Because if separate denominations, except those that might be very rich, 
But if separate denominations try to have a, a, a school, they might not be able to have, to attract the quality of teachers, they might not have the, the kind of money to pay, they might not have the administration. But if we did it as the church in Barbados, I tell you we could do it. We have enough teachers, we have enough principals, we have enough science teachers and computer teachers and all kinds of stuff, but they are spread across the churches. And as long as we are in our little silos, we ain't getting nowhere, and the devil will trample us because we don't realize that unity is strength. And to answer your question, we went to a church that was um, young people, right? And I really want to, I am going to honor my pastor um, because he really, when I got to Barbados, here it is, I got saved in May and I came to university in September. So I didn't know a thing, a thing, a thing. Um, it was interesting, but I was in a church, I thank God, that church had a shepherd. So I want to read just two paragraphs here to the honor of, of this pastor who I, I credit a lot because he taught us, he taught us and he taught us. I think fondly, okay, whatever the size of their church, pastors need our prayers because they have the tough job of leading by example. I think fondly of Pastor Elvin Natrum of Grace Bible Church Barbados, who was my pastor for 17 years. What an example. Pastor Elvin taught the word. He lived the word, preached the word, and spread the word. His sincerity was unquestionable. His character impeccable to this day. There were no financial gains to be had. The church could not even afford to pay him anything near a decent salary. What Pastor Elvin did, he did out of pure passion for Christ and love for his flock. Though, as a matter of necessity, he was working full time for many of his years as a pastor, he cared for every member of giving of himself sacrificially. He made time to guide the young man, this bringing us back to Raymond Ford, visit the sick and elderly, participate in house to house evangelism, and yet prepare sound Bible studies and sermons week after week. He was faithful and disciplined. His word was his bond. Pastor Elvin was strong on discipleship faithfully molded the young men and women under his spiritual care. Over the years, some, like the one that called my husband, have fallen by the wayside, but many are still standing strong. That is the legacy of a true shepherd. We need more Pastor Elvins. And we've been asking again, what can we do to empower? What can we do to help? What can we do? What can we do? Hear this. We might not be able to do much, but we can do everything, 100% of everything with ourselves. It only takes a spark. Don't look around at anybody, just look at yourself. And when nobody can encourage you, you encourage yourself in the Lord. There is a song that says, uh, O Holy Ghost, revival comes from thee. Send a revival. Start the work in me. I think we finished. One more question. Okay, sorry, darling. There's a good evening to Dr. Evelyn. Thank you for a very insightful session. Thank you. I will be very brief in just backtracking to the topic of indoctrination. What are your thoughts and your perspective with respect to diverse in schools? Has diverse counseling evolved from your experience? Because it seems as there is a subtle pushback sometimes. And is there a structure for the pastor from the hierarchy as to 
what or how much can we share because the top brass will call for parent participation and interaction. But far from it, there are concerned parents who genuinely want to give feedback that can lead to foster better relations with both the teaching and the parenting. And sometimes it seems from observation and my experience with having children that there's almost something like a pushback to silence parents or keep them out. So I just wanted you to share your thoughts on that. Thank you. Oy, 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 oy. <laughs> We have to keep our children really close to us. There are some wonderful Christian guidance counselors, and there's some awful non-Christian guidance counselors, and then there's some half-baked, semi-Christian guidance counselors. So it depends on which guidance counselor your child has, and that is why they end up confused. I remember some years ago, I had a 18-month Stint and my job, HFLE, Health and Family Life Education, was to work with guidance counselors across the region and look at how those life skills education. And I realized, hey, there's a trouble here because when you're doing fitness now, there are four, quick, 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 there are four modules, right? Four themes. So you have health and fitness. In health and fitness, we talk about not eating salt and not doing this and not doing that and exercising and so on. Then there is the environment and we say don't throw your snow cone cup out the window. And there is sex, um, self and interpersonal relationships and we say manage your anger and don't just do what you feel like because it might be the wrong thing. And then we come to sexuality and sexual health, and there are no don'ts. Yeah? Actually, I was looking to see, I was looking to see at our um, curriculum. You are teaching health and family life education. I don't think we teach anything about marriage, or we tell them where to go, to get their stuff, you know? So something isn't right. And when I realized that the children, that the guidance counselors themselves had no protection in terms of what you teach. I remember calling the Ministry of Education. Up to this, they still ain't get no answer. But I will still try. You know, I said, so what is the preferred message? because it's not written down, but at least what is the preferred message about abortion? What's the preferred message about early sexual activity? What's the preferred message? So that the standard, who asked about standards? You, right? So we know that if we are teaching our children, we, we can teach them that homosexuality is wrong. And we can teach them that abortion is wrong and that there is no product of conception. It is an embryo which is a little human being and it will be a fetus and it will be by 12 weeks looking pretty much human. But we don't have those things written down. So our children are just open and when it comes up, as it will, it depends on who the guidance counselor is full stop until, which is why and parents, I want you and anybody listening to me on online, I want us to lobby the Ministry of Education in this island of Barbados. We have a national nutrition policy, a school's nutrition policy, correct? And in that school's nutrition policy, they are going to have adolescent-friendly health clinics. And a part of it is that yearly they're going to look at adolescent sexual health. So they have a school's nutrition policy. And they have a, a national grooming policy, correct? 
So a child goes to a graduation and he has all his pink mittens and he thinks, but he's okay because he's neat and he's tidy. So we have a national grooming policy. I would like everybody hearing me to lobby the Ministry of Education in this island of Barbados. It is long overdue. We need a national sex education policy. Because I have heard one set of things in words and I see another set of things in happen indeed. The Ministry of Education said to us, we do not teach comprehensive sexuality education in schools, but go on the dance for life that's dedicated to the youth of Barbados and see if on their website they don't say they teach comprehensive sexuality education in schools. So what's going on? Why can't we have a national sex education policy? What are we going to teach our children? How many genders are there? Male, female, and other? Put it in writing. If that's what you want us to teach, put it in writing and let some of us end up in jail because we are going to come at you. But put it in writing. Don't be dodging and, and, and getting up and talking, big talk. Oh, this will never happen. That's a lie. It's called a lie. Have a national sex education policy because there are some things we need to know. What are we going to teach our children about sex? Is there male and female or is there something else? What are we going to teach them about gender? Is gender fluid and you can be a girl today and a boy tomorrow and a boy trapped in a girl's body? Are we going to teach them that? What are we going to teach them about abortions? We are teaching them that there's a, a book, and I, I was so upset, and this is for primary schools, you know, I have it at home. And they, they're talking about where you can go to get advice, and they talk about all kinds of NGOs, and the nurse, and the clinic, and the guidance counselor. Not a parent, not a parent. So let us, it is time in Barbados and churches, you have the responsibility. Let us have a national sex education policy for schools that we can see in black and white. I'm tired hearing the contradictions because they're saying one thing but they're pushing through another law. They're protecting children, but in that same protection is a whole lot of exposure. Put it in writing. What are we going to teach our children about abortion? What are we going to teach our children about contraception? Yes, we know that some children are sexually active. How are we going to deal with it? Give us something solid. Give us parameters. So please, I beg you, pastors, if only every pastor in the Wesleyan Holiness Church were to lobby it, write, put it in writing, and say we need a sex education policy for schools, they might listen. They're not going to listen to me. I just, blah. Right? But let every church do it. We need a national sex education policy to go with our grooming policy. How are you going to tell me in your grooming policy about gender neutrality. What does, what does gender neutrality mean in terms of grooming? What does personal identity, these are the core values, what does that mean in terms of grooming? Help me out here. Give me a national sex education policy. Since sex is such this big thing, and dance for life, going and asking the dear little sweet children how many partners they had in the last three months, Give me a sex education policy. Finish. Thank you. It has been my absolute delight to be your moderator this evening. You have been such a beautiful audience, so patient. And I'm going to move myself out of the way now and give way to uh, Brother Virtus Seeley, 
to give the vote of thanks, and immediately following um, Brother Virgil's seating, um, the angel of the house, our pastor, Reverend David Garner, he will come and give his closing remarks, the bow on the gift, the icing on the cake. God bless you, Brother Virgil. Thank you very much, Brother Vernon. I thought you were 10 feet tall, and I'm a 4 feet wide. This is what I've heard about your human like me. A blessing of the afternoon, a good evening, rather. Give a honor to God. A good evening to you again, our guest speaker. We really enjoyed it, Dr. Veronica Evening, our pastor, Reverend David Garner, lovely wife. First Lady Carolyn Garner, and of course, our district superintendent, Reverend Virgil Farris, second time to David, and his lovely wife, Reverend Julia Farris, and of course, who can forget our own Reverend Dulles. And of course, members of the audience. I guess you already have heard the ceiling, and it's my privilege to give you the vote of thanks this afternoon for the annual Raymond Ford Lecture. I'm not preaching, so I have five more minutes at most, probably two and a half. On behalf of the Shekinah Wesley Holiness Church here at Church Village, we wish to extend our most sincere thanks first to the Lord God. On behalf of the church, again, allow me to say thanks to you, Dr. Dewey. She has spared the time for a busy schedule to grace this occasion. And as expected, she has delivered well with much conviction and much gusto. And I'm sure that all that have been here this afternoon has been touched by your words. Also, let me thank all the speakers who had their peace. I, I really I enjoyed most of all when her husband has something to say. You notice that. She was very submissive when we say so, ma'am. I'm not sure that when the kids get home, but she was very submissive, but he had something to say. Of course, the topic for today was the role of today's child in tomorrow's church. A topic that by itself should be of concern to all of us as Christians. Now, three things stood to me today. And that is that most persons get saved by age 21. And that is supposed to be 62%, if I heard right. I was listening then. So, so let me change my figures. I heard 62 and I stuck with the 62. Because I had a, I had a, I didn't think that 84 really made sense to me. Because that's not the case in most cases. Anyway, let me not worry about that. So 62% by age 18, but it's 84% by age 21. So I'm learning something here this afternoon. That says it's important for us to get our children into church at an early age, notwithstanding that we're told we should not indoctrinate them. And there's a reason for that. But again, God even not dressed that well, so we'll continue. Maybe you're speaking of God and his many attributes. These are not being taught to our children. And we need to teach our children such. She's not in so I listen quite well. The third one is one that I enjoy a lot. And that is that we must indoctrinate our children. We take it for granted. Islam and Hinduism do it very well. But I just permit me to be off a little. When they say that you are Hindu or you are of Islam, they don't, they don't have a personal relationship with any deity. Just understand that. It is that they came in the home. If you are in my home, you can learn everything so you become one. They have no personal relationship with God, but yet they make sure to their children. What about us? This afternoon, I leave that question to you. Now, just one minute, please. 
I've given some thanks to, to the dignitaries in the house, so now you have to get to those who work very hard today. Big thank you to my twin, they call him my twin, Master of Ceremonies at the Merlin Yard, for his effort for keeping us focused today. Sister Alicia Brassi, and that's a timeless selection. You don't hear too often in mothers saying about the Trinity. It's the third disciple thrown away and made them depart. But Jesus said, Come on to me. Forbid the Lord, for such is the kingdom of heaven. I must say that both Brother Merlin and Sister Lisa almost stole it from my friend Dr. Evelyn. I mean, you all were pretty good. We thank God for that. And also, we need to show some appreciation for the volunteers. Because if they didn't volunteer, we would have some issue with having all the wonderful sound system and all the setups, okay? And with a special shout out to the media team and to our ushers this afternoon. Again, I wish to extend thanks to all of you here. I know someone looking at me and so no, you ain't call my name yet, but I'll get one to you, my, my sister. Because events like this can, cannot happen unless someone starts to wheel rolling. And that person is happening. I, I, I know we have a guest speaker here, but I say I need you to give the guest speaker and Sister Melva a round of applause. Good job, Sister Melva. And if you didn't know, Sister Melva is a district. She's the second set of school at district as well. And I want to say to those who work with her, God bless you. Is at this time I have the honor of saying thank you all. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Do have a blessed afternoon and over to Reverend Garden. Good evening, everyone. Here we can also give Brother Fergus a big thanks for his conclusions. Thanks. I just want to very quickly uh, acknowledge all of you who've come on this evening. Maybe we're looking at the topic for the lecture this year, and Sister Malva put forward the title. I said that's a good one. And um, that, that's the names, but a name came, came to my mind that was Dr. Ronnie the evening. We weren't sure we would get her, but as you can see, there is a little bit of way. And she made it possible. <laughs> so the credit really goes to her. I missed her busy schedule, and I'm saying this for a reason. Despite her busy schedule and other commitments, the topic looking at children caught her immediate attention. And she said, I have to be here. I'm going to make it possible. So she's not just here. I was just trying to work at something. From the very beginning, from the moment she found out we were looking at children, it just got her going. So, what I'm saying to us is that we're not just here tonight just to hear a few phrases and get excited, but we want to really look and see what we can take away from this because we understand what is at stake. Barbados, we talk about our beautiful country, all respect to other countries, but we are the most beautiful of the beautiful. And we want it to stay so, not just in terms of the beaches and the sand, but also in terms of the kind of relationships that we have in terms of our social interactions and such like And that is under serious threat in so many ways. So we want to really go away, think hard about you know, what role can I play so it's not just about, that was an interesting discussion at Chopina, but we're asking ourselves, what adjustments do I need to make so that I can be a part of the change that we want to see? I'm not putting the responsibility on my neighbor, but I'm asking God, what can I do? 
So that to me is the challenge that presents for all of us tonight. Now I, having heard how busy she is, I was really thinking, I, I really kind of killed two birds with one stone because I, I met her, we met again recently, and we had a chance to chat uh, prior to the session. Uh, we met, I think we met when it was about 16 or seven, 16 or so years of age, uh, in another setting. <laughs> another setting, right? Yes. But it's, it's all, it all connects because at that time she was, I don't want to call names, I don't want to call any names, but she was caring for another relative from another country. All right? Uh, we won't go any further than that, but anyway. Good. But she's always been that kind of person, always supportive, and always have a, an interest in children. So I would have liked to have had some further conversation. There were some things in my head, and so when the opportunity came to have someone, I thought she would be the ideal speaker. Having heard her tonight, there, there's so much more I would love to engage her on. I'm not sure she will have the time, but I know she has a book that she has taken the time to share her thoughts, ideas. Can I borrow a book, please? Man? And so maybe like me, you would love to sit down with Dr. Healing and bump some ideas off her, hear her, get some feedback from her. You can get some feedback right away. This book is called Let's Get It Right. All right? No froth, no frills, just salt and light. And it's really a challenge for us as the body of Christ, as you heard tonight, to get it right. And certainly we've been challenged in in so many ways to get certain things right. You know, as a pastor, I've been challenged in a lot of ways uh, to get a lot of things right. A lot of things that as a church we have to get right. A lot of things they really are not working. Right? And we really gotta come together and look at what is working, what is not working, what's the best way forward. And yes, you may have your view on it. I may have my view on it. But how can we come together as a church? I will close with one final thought. And that is, nothing beats love. Genuine love. That is my chorus that I will continue to sing. Jesus Christ said, By this shall all men know you are my disciples if you have love one toward another. And that love is not just a, you know, my best actions pour out love. It is genuine love that is poured out from us through the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And I think that's the real challenge of the church. We really need each and every one of us to get a genuine connection with the Holy Spirit and ask Him, Lord, help me to love you and love others. I said it this morning, the first commandment, the priority commandment is not to do, to go and preach, and that's not, that's not the first commandment, you know. The first commandment is not preaching and teaching and ministry and all these other things. The first commandment, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. That's, that is the priority. And out of that, the Church of Jesus Christ is going to begin to have a serious impact. I don't think we can bypass that. Everything we do is going to be short-lived and temporary. It's going to look good for a minute. It's going to be like straw. You know the three little pigs? We build a lot of straw things. But when the wolf comes and you huff and you buff, the straw comes down. What's the other one you do? It was straw sticks. But then one little piggy built solid. It was a lot more work. But he didn't just try to get something. He had a plan and built it properly and everything built is constructed and solid and solid. And he shut himself in there. And that pig come and huff and puff. He blow to the blow. You know the story man. I think I remember the rest of it. Keep talking about it something right 
So they want to be solid as a church. They want to be solid. It's interesting that little child's story again teaches so much. But we got to, as a church, build solid. Let us build with love. Children need love. And if they get love, it makes a big difference. We are always quick some things to criticize when they do wrong. But you know what they say? In their head or in their mouth, they man, you can't tell me nothing. If you tell them something bad. But if you tell them I love them shoes, you know that that's their heart. You love these shoes. Yeah, 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 these Jordan, you know, these not for them, these daughters. You just gotta, you just, you just wonder your my heart. Because that is what you have gained access just by telling him how nice this Jordan look. So you gotta be, you gotta be smart. You gotta be smart. If you, if you tell him no, we're gonna be choosing when you put the, you gotta be what's in your bike. It may be true. But you're not being smart. You start the wrong way. You start with a criticism. So let's be smart. Let's be wise. God gives us wisdom. Thank you, Dr. Evelyn. Thank you to your husband for sharing you with us for this time. Thank you to Sister Malva, who continues to rally us for this memorial lecture. I think it's something beautiful. And we can use it to challenge ourselves to become the church that Christ wants us to be. Amen. 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 Let's stand as we close off in prayer. You now you have to blame Dr. Healy because she said, in a hurry to go here. So I know you want to get. <laughs> Well, on a serious note, we really thank you for taking the time to come and be a part of this memorial lecture. And uh, we are the richer, I believe, for what you've poured into us and the challenge you've given us. Hey, I used three words this morning when I promoted to the church. You want to get some strategies, you want to get some, some I, mean, I mentioned mentors as well, challenge to mentors. The church needs mentors. Each of us can be a mentor today. So let's pray. Eternal Father, we want to thank you. We thank you that you care about your children. There's a song that says his heart is filled with love. How he loves his children. He loves them, everyone. He longs to hold them tight, take their wrongs, and make them all away. Pen by a guy named Father, that's only so true. There is a father who wants to hold every child. And whether that child is 80 or 8 or 8 months, Father, you love us all. And we're praying today that you would truly touch our hearts as your church and cause us to know that you have called us in this hour as we were challenged to be light and to be salt. Father, we don't have all the answers. Sometimes it seems as though we have none. But we thank you that you are the source of wisdom. And so we pray that you would pour into us as we make ourselves available to you. That you would indeed establish your church. You said that you will build your church. And so God, we set our eyes on you again. We set a, we set a fresh course. We look to you, Father, for the wisdom. We look to you, God, for the favor. We pray, God, that where there have been roadblocks set up to hinder the work of the, of the church, that, Lord, you will dismantle them. We pray, God, you will raise up men and women who would not compromise, but they would walk with integrity. They would stand as Daniel, who refused to allow his position to cause him to, to retreat and to back down and to shift. We pray that you will give those that you have positioned in places, in high places, especially in education. God, give them the backbone. Give them the wisdom and the insight and the strategy. Lord, to serve you and to have the impact that you have positioned them to have in this hour. And I pray, God, that you will continue to cause the church of Jesus Christ to be united. 
we've been challenged to need to come together to understand that indeed as your house, your words is a house divided cannot stand and so often we just see house as being one individual church but indeed Lord your house is, your church is indeed one house you are the God of this house and so God may you continue to speak into the lives of our leaders and challenge them and even as you would challenge them, Father, may we come together to be the church that you've called us to be. We want to pray for you for Dr. Evening. You've called us into the kingdom for a time as this. In a time always, so many are compromising, when so many are willing to settle for man's best. Lord, she chooses to stand for you. I pray, God, that you would continue to open doors. You are God who opens doors that no man can shut, and you close doors that no man can open. Father, in the midst of the fire, you stand with her, and no matter how hot things may be, God causes her to know that she can take it. I pray that when even things seem to be overwhelming, that she will indeed run to the rock that is higher than her, and Lord, you will continue to cover her and continue to strengthen her. We pray for those that you will bring alongside her. Men and women that who are trustworthy. Men and women, oh God, who are able to come alongside and be faithful and committed, not just to her, but God, but to you. Men and women of integrity, whose word, oh God, she can count on. I pray that you will continue to use this woman of God, that she will serve this generation, and that indeed her name, because of the work she does for you and she is doing for you, but one that's, that will stand as a light and an example for many others to follow. We thank you for this evening and the legacy of Raymond Ford, the reminder, God, that what we do can live on so long after us and it can have eternal significance. We bless you, Father, and we pray that as we go from this place, we would go out, not just seeing ourselves as Christians, but we would walk and live as ambassadors, as representatives of the kingdom of God. We give you thanks and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful night. Thank you for being with us in the house and on Facebook. God bless.